The chemical degradation of glass can have dramatic consequences for the condition and appearance of glass objects in museum collections. The interaction with atmospheric moisture will irreversibly change the chemical structure of the material and lead to undesired changes in appearance. My name is Guus Verhaar, and in this presentation, I would like to highlight some research recently conducted in a collaborative project between the Corning Museum of Glass, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History, located at the University of Texas at Dallas. I hope that by the end of the presentation, you will have a basic understanding on glass degradation in museum collections, in particular why it is a problem for museums, what we know about it, how analytical studies can help us understand what is going on and what we still have to learn in order to effectively deal with the problem. My aim is to guide you through the field of glass degradation research by providing you with the necessary background before outlining the specific research goal of the collaborative project. You will learn the basics of the analytical techniques we used and I will show you a selection of the results we obtained. The conclusion will summarize the main outcomes of the project and provide some lines of potential future research. The research into glass degradation started when, in 2009, the Rijksmuseum Vessel Glass Collection was being submitted to an extensive condition survey. The images shown on this slide show examples of irregularities in the appearance of glass objects noted during the survey. Conservators found it difficult to attribute those changes definitively to chemical decay of glass, limiting the identification of glass objects at risk of further decay. The question that they posed was, is it possible to identify vulnerable glass objects in an early stage before any changes in appearance occur? And this is where we started the analytical work on glass degradation in museum collections. In the next slides, I will walk you through the necessary background information to understand the starting point of the collaborative project. And I will show you some examples of glass decay in museum collections and talk about the principles underlying glass degradation. The material degradation of glass objects can lead to several undesired and sometimes detrimental changes in appearance. The study object shown here clearly shows one of the major problems, the accumulation of moisture on glass surfaces leading to a matte appearance of the object. The moisture accumulation is related to the presence of salts on the surface, which becomes clear when the storage environment is drier and the salt crystallizes, as can be seen in this image. Another phenomenon is the dehydration of the top layer of the glass. This can lead to a dramatic change in appearance, the formation of a network of hairline cracks. This is often referred to as crizzling. In this case, the object was moved from a humid environment to a dry environment, which led to the dehydration of the top layer of the glass, which in turn caused the formation of these cracks. How detrimental this can be for glass objects is really highlighted in this case. Another example of crystalline is this pot. And again, it shows how dramatic the process can be. This uh, glass item used to be transparent and colorless. Now it has turned opaque because of the micro cracks covering the entire surface and pink because of the change in oxidation state of manganese, manganese, which is usually added during glass manufacturing to decolor the glass. As a final example, glass decay can lead to peculiar degradation phenomena on materials in juxtaposition with the glass. In this case, the copper substrate of a Limoges enamel plaque shows the development of a particular corrosion product as a result of the present presence of glass degradation products and the subsequent reaction with the copper. In order to understand why these phenomena, phenomena occur, we need to have a general understanding of glass chemistry. 
Generally speaking, glass consists of three main ingredients, a network former, a network modifier, and a network stabilizer. For historic glass, the network former is typically silicon dioxide for which sand is used as a raw material. However, because silicon dioxide has a melting temperature above 1700 degrees Celsius, this could not be used by glass makers in the past. Uh, therefore, they added a flux, which lowers the melting temperature of the batch, but also introducing, introduces alkali ions into the glass, changing the glass structure and leading to increased solubility in water. To counteract this, a stabilizer is usually added in the form of um, calcium carbonate, uh, which turns into calcium oxide in the glass. After melting these ingredients together and upon cooling, a glass is formed when the atoms in the material arrange themselves in an amorphous structure as seen on the right. In contrast to a crystalline structure, which is shown on the left, there is no long-term order and the atoms are distributed almost randomly similar to a liquid. The images here show what a pure silicon dioxide glass looks like, looks like but at, as discussed, other elements are present in historic glass, leading to a different structure of the uh, of the atoms in the glass network. The addition of the flux and stabilizers result in a different glass structure um, and includes the, includes the incorporation of different cations. In addition, there are now two distinguishable, distinguishable types of oxygen. Oxygen that bridge two silicon atoms called bridging oxygen and oxygen that is only connected to one silicon atom, um, which we refer to as non-bridging oxygen. This non-bridging oxygen um, can form another chemical bond with another species, which in the case of glass is often the cations introduced from the network stabilizers and modifiers, typically sodium, potassium, and calcium. The bond between the non-bridging oxygen and the cations is an ionic bond, which is much weaker than the covalent bond between oxygen and silicon. This plays a crucial role in the degradation process. The main form of degradation of historic glass is the interaction between the glass itself and water in the atmosphere. As a result of this interaction, glass cations, in particular, in particular sodium and potassium, may leach out of the glass and will be will be replaced by hydrogen ions. This is accompanied by the migration of molecular water into the glass structure, leading to the formation of an altered surface layer. This layer can consist of up to 20% of molecular water and can be observed in cross sections of degraded glass, as can be seen here on the right. A distinct surface layer is formed on top of the glass and has a lower density um, it is important to note that not all glasses in museum collections as, exhibit this behavior. Um, the main factor that causes the degradation is the composition of the glass itself. Generally speaking, glass with a high concentration of modifier cations, that is the alkali ions, uh, is regarded as unstable in composition, but small variations in composition may lead to a more or less stable glass. Here in the bottom, I show a simplified reaction of what is happening inside the glass. The cations that are connected to the silicon oxide network through the non-bridging oxygen um, are removed because the ionic bond is broken in the presence of hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen ions and water, resulting in the release of those species um, and their migration to the surface of the glass. Typically, these leached cations usually react on the surface of the glass with atmospheric anions where they form salts. It is the presence of these salts that largely determines the appearance of an object. 
Here I show you some examples of salt accumulation on the surface of a glass. On the left is an image from an object in the Corning Museum of Glass Collection, while on the right you see the same study object. Often these salts are hygroscopic and attract water from the atmosphere, increasing the rate of deterioration, as water is the main agent causing glass decay. The deliquescence relative humidity, the point in atmospheric humidity where salts start to attract water from the atmosphere, determines when the salts start, when the water starts accumulating on the surface, and it depends on the nature of the salt. Therefore, recommendations for climate conditions uh, in storage and display facilities are based on the nature of the salts presence on, present on unstable glass surfaces. And as you can see, when this glass was placed in a dry environment, namely a desiccator containing uh, silica gel to dehydrate the environment, the moist film on the surface turned into uh, crystal, crystalline salts uh, present on the surface. So in conclusion, there are two factors influencing the degradation of glass, the composition of the glass itself and the environment in which the glass is kept. An unfavorable combination of the two will lead to the degradation of glass. With all this in mind, we started the analytical research to support conservators in dealing with unstable glass in museum collections. While dealing with unstable glass in museum collections, there are three main issues identified by conservators where analytical research could be beneficial. This is the identification of vulnerable objects, developing guidelines for the prevention of further decay, and studying the effect of active conservation treatments, such as cleaning the glass with solvents. In the rest of this talk, I will focus on the above item, the identification of vulnerable objects. Um, this problem can be approached by looking at the presence of degradation products, service deposits, uh, namely the salts, and by characterization of the degraded layer in order to advance our understanding of the degradation proce process. So this is almost a fundamental study of glass alteration. And of course, these topics are associated with the other two uh, main issues identified by the conservators. The work I present today originated from a collaborative project between three institutes, the University of Texas at Dallas, in particular the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art, Art History, the Rijksmuseum and the Corning Museum of Glass. Their collaboration resulted in a three-year postdoctoral position where uh, we were carrying out research um, to improve the conservation of vulnerable glass artifacts in museum collections uh, with a specific focus on the needs of the conservation and curatorial community in order to really cater to those people who have to deal with the preservation of glass collections in museums. Prior to this, um, this current project, we had already worked on the development of an early warning system based on the presence of characteristic ions on the surface of glass objects. These ions were analyzed with an ion chromatography protocol specifically developed for the identification of unstable glass. This work and subsequent ion chromatography studies were conducted in collaboration with Professor Maarten van Bommel at the University of Amsterdam. We demonstrated that in particular, the presence of sodium and potassium is characteristic of unstable objects. A study at Museum Boymans van Beuningen illustrated this. The objects had been subjected to a rigorous condition survey, where definitely unstable and definitely stable objects were identified based on their visual appearance. After this condition classifications, all objects were cleaned at the same time using the same method. What these two figures show 
is the concentration of ions in samples gathered from the surface of a selection of objects from Museum Boymans van Beuningen. These samples were taken five years after the cleaning procedure and no changes in appearance were observed on either the stable objects or the unstable objects. Nonetheless, a clear difference between unstable objects and stable objects could be observed based on the presence of ions on the surface. The stable objects are uh, represented by the lighter color and the darker color represents the unstable objects. The figure on the right shows the sum of the total alkali concentration, that is the sum of the sodium and potassium concentrations, which appears to be characteristic of glass stability for most objects. We identified a, a benchmark ion concentration for this sum, and all the objects in the stable group were below this benchmark, while Almost all objects, with the exception of a few in the unstable group, were above this benchmark. After this first step in understanding the problem of, of glass decay and trying to deal with it, we set out to investigate glass degradation further and wanted to look at what was changing inside the glass as well. In order to do this, we were using mainly three techniques. First, ion chromatography, which I already showed, allows for the investigation of ions on glass surface, glass surfaces. A typical result is a chromatogram where the peak position is characteristic of the identity of the ion. So for example, this peak represents sodium and the peak area is characteristic of the concentration of that ion. The detection limits are low enough to allow for the investigation of invisible degradation product on glass, glass surfaces, as shown in a previous slide. The second technique we used is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS in short. This technique allows for the identification of elements present in the top few nanometers of a sample, but requires an ultra high vacuum. It is a commonly used technique in analytical surface science, but has been used only limitedly for cultural heritage. A typical spectrum looks like this. It shows the electron binding energy on the horizontal axis here, with the intensity of the peaks on the vertical axis. The binding energy is characteristic of the elements present and small shift in peak position or binding energy provide information on the chemical environment in which these elements are present. It can thus be used to investigate changes in glass composition as well as changes in glass structure as a result of glass degradation. The third technique we used is laser ablation, ICPMS. This technique uses a laser, shown on the left, is the laser, to remove a small amount of material from the sample under investigation. This ablated material is then transferred to a mass spectrometer through a little tube going from this piece of equipment to this piece of equipment um, to a mass spectrometer where the composition of the sample can be analyzed. Because the technique is sensitive to virtually all elements present in the glass, it can be used to quantify the composition. We use a technique called pseudo cross-sectioning where the laser passes multiple times over the same line digging a tiny trench and allowing the production of a 2D depth profile, as shown in this schem schematic figure. By using these three techniques, we learn something about what is happening on the surface of the glass, as well as what is changing inside the glass. I will now walk you through some of the main outcomes we obtained um, through the application of these three techniques. First, we start with the refinement of the early warning system. Even though it worked well in the study of museum objects, there were still some questions um, that were open uh, about, this, 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 about this protocol. Uh, during the collaborative project, three students worked on the refinement of the, of the ion chromatography 
protocol um, and they addressed the most important question first, namely that for a lot of objects, the distribution of ions on the surface appear to be heterogeneous. So we were wondering if this was um, a result of the protocol, if the protocol was unreliable or that this was really um, a heterogeneity present on the glass surfaces. A first student who worked on the project was Denny Verschorm, and he worked on testing the protocol and validating it on several unstable dummy glass samples. And he demonstrated that the results were reproducible in those controlled conditions. This was encouraging as it meant that the protocol was working as it should. The large heterogeneity, however, was still a problem. So Denny came up with a water drop method. Um, a drop of deionized water is applied to the surface of a glass and left there for a certain amount of time. During this time, there will be an ion exchange process occurring between the glass and the water, meaning that ions from the glass network are extracted into the glass droplet, resulting in an elevated concentration of those ions in the glass droplet. A series of exposures of the glass to the water drop is carried out with increasing exposure time. And the hypothesis is that the speed at which the ion exchange reactions occur is different for stable and unstable glass, thus potentially acting as a more reliable way to identify unstable glass object. Then he performed some tests at the end of his internship on two samples, a piece of unstable glass uh, and, a and, a, and a piece of pure quartz as a reference. The results are shown in the, in the figure to the right here. Clearly, there is an increase in sodium concentration, the blue crosses, uh, with increasing exposure time, um, which can be attributed not to the absorption of ubiquitous sodium in the atmosphere, but is really a result of the extraction of sodium from the glass structure. Because Danny was only able to fit one experiment uh, on this topic in the end of his internship, the next student, uh, Jelle Tromp, did further work uh, on refining the method. He encountered, again, heterogeneity in the results. In particular, he demonstrated that the sampling location is crucial for ion extraction, especially when a glass uh, has a history. What he had at his disposal was a piece of glass removed from a, a piece of furniture, a, a historic cupboard. It was removed during restoration as the glass was unstable and the accumulated moisture was a potential hazard for the wood. Yella showed that the Iron concentration in the applied water droplets was higher on the edges of the glass, as you can see in this plot of the measured iron sodium concentration uh, on different spots of the glass. Upon closer inspection of the sample, there appeared to be a difference in visible degradation at, at the edge of the sample. This could potentially be attributed to the way the glass was mounted in a piece of furniture. Um, thankfully, for homogeneous samples, he did obtain reproducible results. The third student, Imona Mosk, continued working on the water drop method and investigated the effect of drop volume and the area of the droplet that covered the glass, under the assumption that a larger droplet would increase the rate of ion exchange. She demonstrated that the evaporation of water could have a large effect on the drop volume when the drop is left on the glass surface for an extended amount of time. The images shown on the left show the decrease of the droplet height and thus volume after 10 minutes of exposure. She further investigated how this affected the measured ion concentration. The results shown in the graph show that the measured sodium concentration at different exposure times for different droplet volumes, this figure. 
based on these results, she recommended to not use the 10 microliter droplets, the smallest amount she tested, because the evaporation of the water causes a decrease in measured concentration, as can be seen in the graph. The larger droplets of 100 microliters caused a larger error in the measurements and the extraction of ions into the droplet was not significantly higher than the 50 microliter droplets she tested. Um, so she recommended to further develop the protocol using the 50 microliter droplets as the effect of evaporation is small enough to obtain reliable results and the amount of extracted ions is comparable to the larger droplets of 100 microliters. This is where we ended the uh, work on the refinement of the protocol. It provided us with some relevant research questions um, regarding fundamental degradation processes, such as why do we observe these changes in location? What is the effect of the degradation layer on the extraction of ions using the water drop method? Um, and this could be investigated in future research. The second topic we tackled was the depletion of ions from the glass structure um, by analyzing it with laser ablation ICPMS. This work was carried out in collaboration with the National Institute of Chemistry in Slovenia, in particular Hans van Eltere, Witt Sely, and Martin Sala. Uh, we worked on characterizing the glass composition by using the laser ablation ICPMS technique. They had developed a method to quantify the glass composition in terms of the oxides using this technique. And we applied, applied this, this method to the study of historic degraded glass samples. The image on the left shows the depth profiles for 55 elements of one sample. This covers the entire range of elements present in the glass with the exception of oxygen. The presence of oxygen is incorporated in the calculation of the glass composition, however, um, as we assume that all the elements are present as metal oxides. The figure on the right shows a selection of elements of three samples. So sample 449, for which you see the entire 55 element map on the left, sample 1055 and sample 4011. These are three samples with different degrees of degradation. And we can observe this by looking at the thickness of the degradation layer in these pseudo cross sections. We can see the depletion of lithium, sodium, and potassium in the top layer of the glass, for example, 449, and for example, 4011. Similarly, Lithium and sodium are depleted from the top layer of sample 1055. But surprisingly, no potassium depletion was observed for sample 1055. So this may give us information on the potential presence of ions present on the surface of the glass. Apart from visualization of the top surface of the glass using the pseudo cross sections, we can also use the depth profiles to investigate the active depletion of alkali ions from the bulk glass. In this slide, I show you two figures obtained from the LAICPMS analysis. They represent a sample of degraded historic glass. The glass, in fact, this is in fact the glass from the cabinet described earlier. A fragment of this glass was exposed to accelerated aging at high temperature and high relative humidity, while another fragment uh, was not. The accelerated aging caused the glass to degrade further quite rapidly. And the figures show the sodium oxide concentration plotted against the abla ablation depth. Um, in other words, words, the left bound of the figure shows this represents the surface of the glass. And by going to the right, we go deeper into the glass structure. The left figure shows both sides of the unaged glass. 
inspection of the figure clearly shows a difference between the two sides. And it appears that iron depletion has occurred much more strongly in what we call the top of the glass. It is uncertain why this is the case, but a possible explanation is that this is actually the side of the glass that was facing the wood surface. If a microclimate is created between the glass and the wood, and this contains acidic volatile components which are known to be emitted by the wood, the glass degradation must have taken place much more quicker than on the side of the glass exposed to the air. Another factor that may influence the degradation rate is the potential manufacturing process. If one side of the glass was exposed to a different finishing environment, for example, than the other, that may have affected local glass composition and thus the susceptibility of the glass to deteriorate. The figure on the right shows the sodium concentration of the same side of the glass before, which is the orange, orange line, and after aging, which is the blue line. A difference in sodium distribution throughout the alteration layer, which is marked by the red dashed line, can be observed. A hypothesis is that this is a result of the migration of sodium from the bulk glass through the alteration layer to the surface of the glass during aging. This, however, would require further investigation and repetition of the experiment to be more certain on this theory. What it does demonstrate is the usefulness of the laser ablation ICPMS protocol to investigate the migration of ions through degraded glass layers. And by that, we come closer to predicting glass behavior in museum collections, which is important for the conservation of the artworks. In addition to looking at the distribution of elements through the glass, we have also looked at the chemistry of the degradation layer using XPS. This work was carried out with Professor Amy Walker and a research group at the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Texas at Dallas. This slide shows the analytical setup of the experiments we conducted. On the left is an image of the sample in the XPS sample chamber. A fresh fracture surface was created by breaking the glass. The sample was mounted vertically with a cross section facing up so that a line scan could be made across the surface of the cross section as highlighted in this backscatter electron image. In this way, we can analyze the different layers of the glass, which you can also see in this uh, electron microscope image. We see the altered layer on top and the bulk glass below it, in this case to the side of it. In this way, we obtained a lot of information about the chemical composition and chemical environment of the glass and its alteration layer. We made several interesting observations uh, based on the XPS data, but I will only discuss one of the observations today. As mentioned before, by using XPS, we cannot only identify the elements present in the sample surface, but also investigate its chemical environment. An element that is always observed in XPS spectra is carbon. It is impossible to avoid the deposition of adventitious carbon on the sample surface during preparation. In fact, this peak is often used as a reference peak to correct for potential peak shifts as a result of external factors. This figure shows the region of interest for carbon. The large peak on the right, marked as CH, is the typical adventitious carbon peak. However, we observe two shoulder peaks at higher binding energy. Note that the excess axis is in reversed order going from high to low binding energy. These peaks represent carbonate and formate compounds. And we did not expect to, to find these compounds in our samples, but they are clearly there. So then the question became, where do those species come from? Are they potentially a remnant of the raw materials used to produce the glass? Carbonates are typically used as raw materials, and when the, when the raw glass batch is heated, carbon dioxide is removed and oxides remain. This process is called calcination. 
If the calcination was not complete during heating, some carbonates may have remained in the glass network. Another potential source of these carbon-containing compounds is the degradation of glass. During the degradation process, we know that sometimes carbonate fo carbonates form, but their presence should then be limited to the glass surface, where the alkali ions react with atmospheric molecules and not within the glass structure as we observed. Further investigations of the data showed a slight increase in the binding energy of this peak as a function of depth, as can be seen in the figure to the left. We observe formate and carbonate close to the surface and carbonate in the bulk glass. It is important to note that the identification of carbonate extends the depth of the alteration layer. So we do observe it in the bulk glass. The shift of formate to carbonate is represented by the shift of this shoulder peak um, highlighted by the dashed line. These observations suggest that the presence of these compounds is a result of both manufacture and aging. If carbonate is, carbonate is the dominant species present, they can react with water to form formate. But the presence of carbonate in the bulk loss is likely a result of the incomplete calcination during the manufacturing process. We are currently investigating the data further to explain our observations better. And with this, I conclude my presentation of the glass degradation studies. What I hope to have demonstrated is that the analytical research can have an important value in the conservation of historic glass. The identification of unstable glass in an early stage is important for conservators as it allows for the implementation of pre preventive measures to avoid further degradation. Procedures like the water drop method not only provide us with tools to identify unstable glass in museum collections, they also give us insight into the subtleties of glass degradation and help us understand why we observe particular degradation patterns on museum objects. The identification of ionic species present on glass surfaces is an important factor in the identification of suitable storage conditions. They determine the point at which water may be attracted to the glass surface, which would increase glass degradation. This information could be used to develop guidelines for the safe storage of unstable glass. The study of ion depletion using laser ablation ICPMS provides insight into the depletion of cations, and aging studies can help us understand why we find certain ions on a glass surface and others not. The XPS studies help us understand the chemistry of the alteration layer and potentially sheds new light on our understanding of glass chemistry. The presence of carbonate within the glass structures has not received much attention, but warrants further research. And finally, I hope to have shown you that the combination of all these techniques applied in the presented research provide an integral understanding of the degradation process, which is so desperately needed by conservators. Finally, I would like to thank all the people I've worked with to make this research possible. And in particular, I thank Norman Tennant, who has been very supportive in pushing the research forward, and I'm very grateful to him. And to conclude, I would like to thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.